Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. This week I'm joined with Nicholas Grun, CEO of Lateral Economics. We talk about his work as an economist, but also the mindset that he has adopted in order to try and explore some of the unthinkable questions that are largely ignored in the economic space, both at a policy level and also at an academic level. And one example of that in which he explores is the use of information as a public good and as a private good and how we can make information available so that policymakers or local councillors could use it in order to solve some issues that they have encountered. And one example Nicholas has pointed out is maybe use inf- the information that Uber has collected over time to help figure out problems regarding the local infrastructure. So Nicholas's idea of data sharing pretty much dominates this conversation and he explores the differences between public and private goods and how we can actually use and collaborate with one another for the collective good in terms of the benefits for society. But we start this conversation on a recent article that he is about to publish called What Economic Reform Thinking Might Have Looked Like If We'd Bother to Do It. And we explored the types of problems that the economics discipline may have failed us due to, say, protectionist policies and how we can actually change and adapt to make it better. And some of these problems he has given an example for is rent-seeking. There's so much more that I wanted to talk to Nicholas about, and I couldn't get it done within the hour, so hopefully we'll get to meet up another time soon and have a second episode in which we'll talk about his work on Adam Smith and also about democracy. And some of these topics will tie in really well with previous episodes, especially with Russ Roberts and Darren Asmoglu. But for now, I hope the topics that we discussed here on information and data sharing and economics reform is something that you'll enjoy. And we touch on how his beliefs and his thinking has transferred into his investments in startups such as Kaggle, which uses information to solve problems. And this company has been recently acquired by Google. Nicholas will also be a guest speaker at the Kilconomics Festival here in Kilkenny in Ireland, which is a blend of economics and comedy. So if you happen to be around in the area or you'd like to do something different, why not come to Ireland? Why not visit Kilkenny from Thursday the 8th of November to Sunday the 11th? Check out kilconomics.com in which you can see a, a schedule of events that are going to be happening over that time, some of which Nicholas will be speaking at. And I might even get to see you there. And for that reason, what I'm going to do is skip ahead and release this episode a little earlier. So other episodes that will be coming after this will be one with Professor Stephen Wright on Equity Q. And I also have one with a previous guest, Naomi Brockwell, also known as Bitcoin Girl, and Harry Markowitz of the Portfolio Theory. So I hope you get to enjoy the month of November with these episodes that are going to be coming up. So thanks always again for listening to the Economic Rockstar podcast. I really hope you get a lot of benefit from it. That we're keeping you company during your drive, your walk or as you relax. So again, I appreciate you listening to the episode each time. And if you haven't done, done so already... Check out your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to the episode. That way you'll always get a notification when a new episode becomes available. Share with a friend or colleague if you feel that they enjoy the economic side of things or you'd like them to know what economics is all about. That's not just about money or prices. Introduce them into your world and do that through the Economic Rockstar podcast. And if you'd like to support the podcast in any way, just share the episode it's easy to share nowadays but if you'd like to financially support the show check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar and you can help the show for as little as one dollar per month and there are other options in which you can support the show at higher amounts so if you like any of the forthcoming shows and you'd like one of those episodes to be sponsored by you well you can do that so go to patreon and choose one of the levels of which you'd like to support the show at and in that way i will give you a shout out on an episode and have it sponsored by you 
So thanks again for listening. Enjoy this episode with Professor Nicholas Groom. It's a carnival of rent seeking that this is an industry which is extremely complex, which any one body can only understand a certain amount of, in which everyone's got their hand out trying to add a bit of margin here and a bit of margin there. Hello, Nicholas. Welcome to the Economic Rockstar podcast. G'day, Frank. And with that good day, we can tell that you're Australian. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can. My father was Austrian and uh, he used to say g'day with great gusto, even though with an Austrian accent. So okay. it's very infectious when you live here. So is that where the surname is coming from, Green? Correct. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it's an Austrian or German for Green. Okay. And uh, your father emigrated to Australia, was it? Well, compulsorily so. You'd be familiar as an Irishman with uh, Australia's habit of importing some of its inhabitants compulsorily yeah. as convicts. And he was a convict of sorts in World War Two. So he found himself in uh, England as a European or as an Austrian Jewish refugee, effectively. And uh, when the war, when the Cold War, t- sorry, when the phony war of World War II turned into the hot war of 1940, uh, and Winston Churchill was talking about fighting them on the beaches and all the rest of it, they, he, he, you can actually go back to that speech, and just before he says we will fight them on the beaches, he makes a brief reference to a number of uh, people who are living in England, uh, most of whom are refugees, who will be interned for security reasons and that that was a reference to my father and 60,000 other people who were fairly quickly uh, rounded up and sent to a camp at least in my father's case near Liverpool a place called Highton and then plonked on a boat and sent out to Australia and in fact that's something I have in common with Sir Nicholas Stern we are both descended our fa- both of our fathers were on the same boat it was called the Danira and his father went back to England and my father stayed here oh, well wow. that's a that's an amazing story because the yeah. risks even the risks to sail across oh. from England well, were, to Australia indeed indeed there was a there was a german u boat about a day out of port that fired on them and the the torpedo didn't uh didn't detonate so uh they were sa- they were saved uh, a week beforehand. A boat called the Arundora Star had been sunk with loss of life of the same order of magnitude as the Titanic. So it was a pretty dangerous time. Talk about destiny, then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that that's something I'm, I'm sure you cherish. You know that type of history and respected what your father had um, had gone through, and other uh, people indeed, like him. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and it's something. I, I if I look back on it, I um, realise that I've got I got more and more interested in it as it was becoming too late to ask my father. Um, if I look at the sort of document, I, I think of my interest in this as going back a long way. But if I look at the documentary record, I didn't really start writing much about it until towards the end of my father's life, which was twenty years ago, and I've become quite the um, uh, well, I'm not a sort of a, I, I don't sort of keep records or do, go to any great lengths, but I'm I'm very interested in it and um, regard it as a, a great thing, a great part of um, who I am really. Um, and uh, there you are, I'm a proud European of sorts. Oh yeah, yeah. And what what brought you into economics? Because you're based on your profile, Nicholas. I'm sure. Yep. If you don't mind to give people uh, your background yep. and just because you are a, an economist, uh, an entrepreneur, and a commentator of sorts in terms of the economy and that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's actually the same story, which is via my father. So, uh, my father was a quite prominent economist in Australia and a quite an important architect of um, what we would now call neoliberal reform in Australia in the 1970s. And I, in, in fact, both my brother and I, had one of our ambitions in life was not to become economists, and we both failed. Um, you can come up with stories about that that are either flattering to economics, i.e. it's also fascinating, or less flattering to economics, which is that economists managed to 
troop through the undergrowth, destroying so much meaning that all that is left is dollars and cents. Anyway, you can take your pick as to what led us both in the end to take up economics. Um, but I had it. I mean, it, it is actually an important part of any explanation of what I'm like as an economist because I started practicing economics. I won't say before I understood it, but before I was received any formal training. So when I was in my early 20s, I went to work for the industry minister in Australia and we were, re we, we were restructuring the car industry. And at least as I reconstruct it, looking back, I hadn't done any economic training, but I had quite a strong e economic intuition and – one of the things that I've noticed ever since is that economics, people get taught economics and they think of economics as this body of learning and also a bit as a badge of tribal identity. So, you know, if you're in the central agencies, you know, Treasury or the central department of the head of government, um, there are lots of signals of who an economist is. An economist is somebody who typically prefers market outcomes to government-directed outcomes and things like that. Mm. And what I discovered was that the discipline itself and these sort of instinctive responses tended to crowd out the slower process of trying to adapt those things to the merits of the situation at hand. And so my way of doing economics, which I, I, I run a company called Lateral Economics, and it is to pay a lot of attention to the way in which we, uh, the way in which we think about the problem in order to subject it to uh, economic in order for our economic intuitions to work on it. Um, so let me give you a simple example of that. When we were working on the car industry, every all the economists said what we need is free trade. Now, I didn't have any disagreement with that at all because we had ridiculously high tariffs. Um, and it's pretty commonsensical that that's a crazy thing for a small country to have very high tariffs. It's going to lead to a lot of inefficiency. Can I ask you, Nicholas, actually, um, did Australia produce their own cars at the time or is it we just did. imports? We did. We just stopped. No, no, we've just stopped. We were one of the, I think it's seven developed countries that produced cars. And the last, I don't know whether we still produce any cars, but we had three large car manufacturers here, Ford, Hold, uh, Ford General Motors and Toyota. And their, um, uh, Ford has certainly produced its last car here. I think that, yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure that's true of um, General Motors. And if it's not true of Toyota now, it will be true very soon. So we produced them a complete, large, pretty much complete cars from about 1948 until 2018. Uh, so um, we were, and, and that was sort of part of national pride and all the rest of it. We actually produced them quite efficiently for quite a long time. We were exporting about 20% of the cars we made when we were making them efficiently. And in fact, I think the date, it's a, quite an extraordinary thing that Japan, I think this is the correct number, I think Japan produced f fewer cars per annum than Australia did until some amazingly late period, uh, late date like 1971 or 1969 or something. So we were quite a substantial car maker reasonably efficient car maker, but we had drifted into more and more protectionist policies. And I had no problem. I, mean, I was very keen on reducing the amount of assistance we provided and lowering tariffs, but there was a, there was a further issue that I wanted to address, which was uh, it seemed to me that an industry which until five years previously had export the most efficient manufacturer had exported 20% of the product they made, that if we just started with tariffs uh, and we, let's say we, it was a very complicated system and the basic idea was to tarificate the quotas. In other words, you have quantitative restrictions. Um, there are only so, so many imports allowed in, then you replace that with a high tariff of, say, 100%, and then you lower the tariff. Now, the problem with that is that the industry is a complex beast, and part of the industry is quite efficient, and part of the industry is very inefficient. 
And starting with 100% tariffs and then phasing down to zero or close to zero is going to give you no assistance whatever to develop those cars where you might be an efficient exporter. Now, you can say, why give the, why give them any assistance? And that's a perfectly valid argument. But the point is you are giving the rest of the industry assistance. And it makes no sense if you're giving a hundred percent assistance to assembling Toyota Corollas in Australia, not to give some assistance to exporting Ford Falcons to, you know, South Africa and Asia and London, I mean, England, for instance, as we were in the 60s and 70s. So that was the that was the debate I tried to have. And unfortunately, it was had in slogans. People would say, well, you must be a protectionist because you want assistance for exports. And I'd say, no, no, I don't want assistance for exports. I want the same amount of assistance for exports as we give to import replacement. And they'd say, well, we'd like to give no no assistance to import replacement. I said, well, that's not in your policy. Your policy is to reduce assistance gradually. If you're going to reduce assistance gradually, you've got to answer the question of why over the 10 or 15 years that you phase out assistance, you are only giving assistance to the least prospective, the least promising activity, which is import replacement. So it was the failure to have that argument that sort of led me to try to formulate the argument in a way that cut through with economists. And I, I sort of did that in a way, but it didn't make, and, and that is to simply say that cutting tariffs equalizes assistance between industries and to, and, uh, uh, but tariffs, um, without export subsidies have unequal assistance within industries. And then you would look at in, intra-industry trade and things like that. Um, so that's a way of saying that was in those days, kind of, if you like, lateral economics. In those days, it was bringing on board a new perspective. But I was really struck by how resistant trained economists were to thinking this through on its merits rather than saying, oh, well, I'm an economist and I'm in favour of free trade. Well, that didn't answer my question. Is that the problem with economics at the time in 1970s onwards um, and yep. ignoring the intuition yep. that economists could have but always resorted back to the theoretical or the debates that were ongoing amongst, amongst academia and practitioners? Yes, I agree. I think that there is a – I mean, I'd call it a, a, economics is a – Economic debate is a kind of a language game, to use you know, the philosopher Wittgenstein's term. It's a, a set of protocols or a certain kinds of things which ways you express yourself and ways that you choose not to express yourself because you don't want to be mistaken. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is that somebody thinks you're a protectionist. Um, so I'm quite skilled at trying to express myself in a way that tries to force people to think about my arguments rather than to say, oh, that means you're a protectionist or that means you're free market or that means you're pro-intervention or that means you're left wing or that means you're right wing. I think those things hugely get in the way of just trying to address questions on their merits and do the best we can and also to understand that we're all massively ignorant. Um, you know, this isn't physics. <laughs> we're not, you know, we know enough physics to send a man to the moon and back. And we don't, we, the, the amount that we don't know about the economy is much more than we do know about the economy. And we, we kind of get, lo we get lost in a, a lot of the, I suppose, the, the schools of thinking in economics that, as you correctly pointed out, people categorize you if you've uh, suggest mm. something mm. or you make a recommendation and obviously then the you're pigeonholed into a particular line of thinking but to embrace yeah. just to remove all those categories or those ideologies just to embrace what we actually see in front of us and adapt to how the economy changes how advancements in technology could change people's behavior t t and change how money flows within the economy and, you know, uh, once we adapted those new ways of transactions or behaviors, then it isn't more important to ditch 
perhaps ditch the old st- type of thinking and maybe embrace what we see in front of us and continuously develop a more mature understanding of what's going on around us and also learn from the past if we have mistakes. Mm, mm. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's both not possible nor advisable to do entirely without ideology. All I would say is that these kinds of considerations are good questions, good uh, good starting points. They're terrible ending points. They should just help us kind of get the lie of the land and then go hunting around for stuff that helps us come to a conclusion that we're reasonably comfortable with about what sort of policies we should pursue. You're writing an article at the moment, what economic reform thinking might have looked like if we'd bothered to do it. And yeah. you mentioned that the architects of, and this is just a quote, quoting your article, the architects of economic yep. reform have failed to move beyond the vision of reform. So we we have these disasters like rent seeking, an example of will be your lobbying, and maybe even the protectionist policies of Australia in the seventies we see again um, present day in the United States. Mm-hmm. And are we mm-hmm. learning from what what has to change? What has to reform? Well, well, let's let let's have a think about protectionism. Um, if you think about the United States, and let's leave the uh, so, so here's a little trick that I'm going to play on you, a fairly standard sort of thing, which is let's leave trade to one side when we talk about protectionism because that's such well-worn territory and you can probably guess what my views are, which is that I wish Donald Trump wouldn't be messing quite so much with the, the, the degree to which we've already achieved free trade. But if you're thinking about protectionism, you think about the political economy of protectionism, then let's talk about health care in America. American health care has is, costs about 50% more of GDP than healthcare anywhere else, and it's no better than anywhere else. That's a that's a big stylized fact. Why is it like that? Well, essentially because it's got a sort of protectionist structure, and by that it isn't the government that is directly protecting anyone in particular. The government's rather out of it, and it's the all the other countries where government is somewhat more involved in healthcare that have more efficient healthcare systems. Okay. The reason that the American healthcare system looks rather like the Australian car industry did <laughs> under protection is that it's a carnival of rent seeking, that this is an industry which is extremely complex, which any one body can only understand a certain amount of, in which everyone's got their hand out trying to add a bit of margin here and a bit of margin there. And the result is that quite a part, uh, that, that it, paradoxically, is that um, where it took bad government intervention in the area of car manufacture to build a highly complex and highly inefficient industry in the United States, as far as health care is concerned, we've got closer to that sort of structure with less government intervention rather than more government intervention. So that it isn't government intervention per se. It, there's more to it than that for these layer, these, this kind of rich layering of rent seeking to, to take place. Uh, and you can see that in, in law. Again, the legal sector in the United States, I think, is probably likewise socially very inefficient and very expensive. Um, And again, it's not, uh, well, it's sort of a bit nonsensical to talk about the legal system as if it could be not have government involved. It's it's about what governments do. But the legal, but the legal profession itself is um, very highly driven by profit seeking in the United States and that's part of the recipe for a very high cost uh, a very high cost sector so um, you know these 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 patterns are richer more interesting and more individual than these very crude ideologies which sort of generally say government bad market good Where's your view on – where do you stand regarding patents, Dan? Uh, well, if you 
if you know something about patents, you know that firstly, whenever the legal system is involved, there are huge expenses, huge costs. And I guess, I mean, look, I, uh, I, I'm a great, uh, I have great faith in my own ignorance and everybody else's. Uh, but I was quite influenced by a very radical book written by um, Levine and Baldron, I think their names, uh, David Levine. Uh, Michelle Baldron, if I've got the names correct, called Against Intellectual Monopoly, in which they argue that you could completely do without uh, patents uh, and indeed copyright, and that they don't argue there would be no losses, um, but they argue that on balance you would have a more, health, you know, you would have faster growth and greater wealth. And I think that's right. I, my guess is that's right, given the incredible costs of copyright and patents. But, of course, there are some sectors where you can see that there would be massive change and, and in the immediate term that change would not be positive if you got rid of patents or, or um, watered them down a lot. So that would be true in pharmaceuticals and so on. Now, the way pharmaceuticals – the whole structure of the pharmaceutical industry isn't a very healthy one. It's Again, it's one of those um, inefficient, high-cost ones. Um, but if you didn't reform that and simply remove patents, then fairly quickly you would what what pipeline of drug development there is would dry up. So, you know, you need to you need to think about those kinds of things. But if you look, I mean, the most dramatic thing is to look at internet at inter, at innovation on the internet and Sean Pater's idea that you need very high amounts of research and development expenditure which have to be funded from monopoly rents. Well, that's not true. That's not how we got Google or any of the incredible uh, the incredible uh, innovations on the internet. So there is certainly a very substantial sector of the economy in which I have little doubt that intellectual property protection gets in the way of innovation. Where the balance lies is a, is a harder question. Yeah, like you, you mentioned Google and Yahoo. I, I guess they were able to establish themselves as a search engine business because it was firstly a government-funded f- uh, program to, to, to develop well, the internet. Well, no, I don't think that's right. Well, sorry, yes, the internet is a was was the the research on which the internet is based and the early versions of the internet are government-funded. That's correct. So but therefore, there's no the, patent then on us. And they were able well, to- well, it was built. You see, it was built by these radical scientists, um, Vint Cerf, and then later the designer of the World Wide Web, um, uh, what's his name, Tim Berners Lee, yeah. and so on. And they were very self-conscious about trying to make this thing as open as possible and as difficult to allow. It, it, they wanted to make it as difficult as possible for restrictive behaviour to. Get, uh, they wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to route around restrictive behavior, and they did that brilliantly. And the result is that what the, from the, the bit I've read on Google, um, Google cost about a million dollars to set up and establish on the Internet. Now, you can raise a million dollars and then make money out of advertising. Uh, with, you don't need any patents for any of that sort of stuff. But the unfortunate thing, well, I don't know if it's unfortunate because the competition authority in the EU or the, the, the regulations there, they fined Google a lot there recently. Mm-hmm. And now, I, I'm not sure if I read this correctly, but I think Google could be bringing in a pricing policy in Europe where they could be charging one euro for every, I don't know if it's every day or to customers who are going to be using the, the services like Google Maps and all that. Uh, really? Yeah, oh, well, yeah. I, I don't know. To, to I don't know what the, the cost. story is. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, oh, I see. Yes. Well, that's all. That's all very intriguing. I, I, I mean, we can talk about that at some stage. I'm a bit surprised when people are thinking about antitrust and so on with digital that people don't talk more about access regimes. I would have thought <coughs> it makes more sense not to try and bust the, these things up, which are natural monopolies in any event, but to impose access regimes on them. So we've got quite a bit of experience in that yeah. in Australia. 
Uh, so with pipelines and things like that, we have a national access regime which says that if a particular asset like a pipeline or a railway is a natural monopoly and is a an asset of national significance, that we will – the government will the, – the law is that people can – demand access to that network at a at a cost reflective commercial price and uh i think that there's quite a bit you could do with some of these um internet monopolies by um by imposing these kinds of things so these internet companies they have a lot of information and i reckon a lot more information than central planners or government would have mm and yet we rely on the policies implemented by um, central planners, be they economists mm, mm. or government officials. Mm. How important or do you think there's a, a skew in terms of the information that's available and hence any policy that's implemented is not necessarily a true reflection of the information that could be attained? Oh, well, it's an interesting question. I mean, if you look, this is a nice example of the sort of thing I see all the time, which is that... If you look at statistical agencies around the world in Australia, it's called the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I'm sure that, you know, the CEO of these places will have given a speech saying, you know, that there's all this data that um, uh, private companies have got and wouldn't it be nice if the bureau, bureaus of statistics had them. Uh, but they're not really very serious about that. And I think that that's a discussion that we should, that should be opened up quite vigorously. So, uh, you know, we should be, talking uh, not just, I mean, we spend almost all the discussion about data. Most of the pushback, if you like, that the the great internet oligarchs get about their data is sort of about privacy and also about how we own the data, uh, or that's the claim. And I think all of that is itself in a very again, to use a you know, very um, loaded term, but it's, it's all in a very neoliberal frame. Uh, the idea of owning data is a funny idea. because uh, Controlling data is a much better way to think about it because owning data, it's a bit silly for people to own data given that data is a potential public good. It's a non-rival good. We don't talk about owning a word and it, everybody gets the creeps when, you know, a company gets to trademark a common expression or something like that um so um so, so rather than just getting the creeps about privacy and and us yelling at you know us saying oh we should be paid for our data there's just this question of how could we make that data as useful as possible and you know we should Uber data should be available to town planners, yeah. um, uh, appropriately anonymized, and so on. I don't know whether you're familiar with Zero, but Zero is a New Zealand-based accounting firm that uh, accounting software firm that uh, makes its software available around the world, and it has fantastic data on firms and all the rest of it. Now. Um, I guess the tax officer might like to get hold of the data and you can see that uh, – and that's not really um, – that's a, a very special kind of question which you might want to hedge in with various legal restrictions. But this is data that is valuable and good on zero for getting it. And I don't want to just move in and nationalise this asset, but I do want to start a conversation, which is what is – let's talk about the most efficient way – to for whoever can benefit from that data to access that data without destroying the incentives to generate the data in the first place. I don't see those sort of conversations taking off. And in fact, what does take off is much more sort of us versus them types of conversations because they get our ideological juices flowing um, and public debate itself is a public good. And so we tend to have public debates organized around emotions and ideologies, not around how can we optimize the usefulness of these incredible new innovations that we see burgeoning around us since the internet came into existence. Because the flip side is there already. I think that 
more of the government bodies are providing their information or making it more available online. I, yeah. I'm not sure if that's a hundred percent true. It's just I'm just going by a documentary, to be honest, by Hans Rosling, The Joy of Stats, and within yeah. that they showed how data is very useful, and it shows the police force. It could be the United States, it could be Sweden, I don't know, but the US, uh, the the police force are providing uh, hotspots of crime, and at what time, and if you're walking in near the area, you can check. Now I don't know if you can check, but it does show where the hotspots are. So a Private company could use this um, public data and create an app, for example, and yeah, have right. have something to display where you, the places you should avoid or the given high potential, the high probability of being mugged, for example. And then you could avoid that or take a taxi before you head into that area. And I think that's quite beneficial. So the reverse is true, given your case of Uber. Maybe Uber could, it would benefit Uber themselves if they could share the data with central planners and identify congested areas in the city, uh, parking difficulties, um, you know, where there could be a likelihood of uh, high pedestrian volume where they might jaywalk across the road and it could yep. lead to potential accidents and try to uh, plan a more of a, a seamless structure or seamless infrastructure in terms of the, the road network uh, to accommodate both cyclists, drive. Uh, car drivers and pedestrians. Yeah. Well, well, I actually chaired a government inquiry into this. It was called the Government 2.0 Task Force in 2009, and we produced lots of recommendations for governments to open up their data to the community for the reasons that your listeners will understand from the examples that you've given. Um, I mean, the interesting thing was that the government accepted all the recommendations and then uh, eight years later, another inquiry made all the same recommendations. Okay. In other words, you can accept recommendations and yet the detailed process of getting this stuff out or is, is often much harder. It's much harder than waving a wand and saying, this is the policy, release the, release the, the data. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the thing that struck me shortly after doing that inquiry, I went to a, a thing called the Open Data, uh, the Open Knowledge Festival in Berlin, and what struck me was that the activists who were trying to get hold of government data and trying to make data more liquid, if you like, trying to get more data out there, were very politically motivated. So, uh, from a left-wing perspective, now I have no problem with that, and so an example of that is. Um, what they called extractive transparency, which is to get, you know, BP and resources companies to uh, publish more information about details of their extraction of resources from third world countries and and things like that. Um, now, I don't have any problem with that at all, but, gee, you know, there is a lot more exciting public value that can come out of a public engagement with this new world of the internet than just a bit of extractive transparency. Um, so, um, so, so the, all the things that I was looking at uh, were things like, you know, trying to find ways to get firms to publish employee engagement data um, which would, now what's the point of that? Well, employee engagement data is the sort of certain, uh, many of your listeners will have had, if they work in a company every few months or every year or so, you'll often fill out a questionnaire saying, you know, I think my boss is, you know, very helpful or I feel aligned with my company's goals or I don't like it much or whatever. Um, and that data is very valuable. And now, of course, it wouldn't be collected if it wasn't value to the company it's valuable to the company itself but it's actually a valuable to employees who might be interested in working in that company um, and if you believe as there are, uh, and there is a lot of evidence to help you believe that employees who are well engaged with their company who think well of their company tend to come from more productive companies um, then that data becomes even more valuable because you might find that investment managers, uh, you know, that investment um, 
allocators look at that data and say, we're going to buy into that company because we think that the company manages its workforce well uh, and stuff like that. Now, to me, there is no comparison between extractive transparency for mining companies. And as I've said, I've got nothing against it um, with something, an initiative like that, um, because that could really generate huge economic benefits. And um, we're not really focused on it because it's not a very strong sort of left. There are no, there's no strong left, right pull on it. There's no ideological demand for it. Um, and I think the, you know, the, I suppose my life as an economist has been sort of rummaging around trying to point some of these kinds of opportunities out that people aren't really thinking about because somehow their heads in the discipline of economics and not so much in the world that they're in looking for ways in which things could be improved or their heads in their ideology or their heads in a struggle between capital and labor and stuff like that. And, you know, it's that, that will go on and that's all fine, but the need to be some people who are looking at the world in a different way and that I can at least count myself amongst such people. Yeah, I, I think it's important to look at, identify holes and maybe explore. And it's very difficult because if you don't know there's a need for this type of data, then you you fail to explore it. But it only takes a few individuals yep. to highlight yep. the need for this, uh, this type of information. So yep. what's, what potentially could be unknown to us we have to ask those questions, and it's something that I discussed with Kevin Kelly in a recent episode, 163. Oh, okay. I'll have a listen. And yeah, uh, yeah I'm we, a we, fan of his work, so I'll have to have a listen to his what he says. Yeah, we we just barely touched on it, but it's nice to bring it up again. And you know, as you identified correctly, there you need to ident- look at and spot those needs for further information. And people can argue saying we could be overanalyzing all of this big data could be too much and the only you know it's a lot most of it is somewhat irrelevant or it's uh, a lot of noise maybe that's true maybe it's not um we we don't i don't know if we have the power to be able to the computing power to be able to uh analyze or extract certain elements of data and create a tell a story of what the data is giving us and i suppose one company again you wrote about 23 and me and they have a, a lot of data and you could say that every piece of information from that saliva sample, which I have contributed myself to, uh, mm-hmm. tells you yep. 100% of all the data that's needed. And they can then remove whatever is, whatever information from that to say that yes, you don't have a threat of Alzheimer's disease or um, whatever other types of diseases. And, you know, they can create a path. And I don't know if that, <clears throat> I doubt that information is, um, made public to or given to central planners it's it's more of a private company even though it was subjected mm. to uh, federal restrictions in the united states a couple of years back that's right that's right well the the, the 23 and me one is a sort of big big idea for me um uh, and it's it, I, I was going to use it here to sort of highlight something which is that the way you've talked about economics is very much in the a sort of scientific mold in which you talk what one talks about an economy and then one talks about how that economy changes and then we think that economists are people who sort of understand exactly how the economy changes and can make predictions about it and stuff like that and then we say well what data do we need to make predictions and then we'll come up with our recommendations and so on now that's fine but that's not the way i think about an economy I think I just walk around, I just wander around looking for things that you can improve. And the thing about 23andMe was that when I first saw Anne Wojcicki, the CEO of 23andMe, present, that was in 2012. And in 2009, I'd done the Government 2.0 Task Force, and I came up with this idea, which is that Google and Facebook and Wikipedia and open source software and blogs are all public goods privately provided. So um, they can be provided for profit in the case of Facebook and Twitter and Google or not for profit in the case of Wikipedia or 
we can't really say what's happening with open source software because each bit of code will be contributed with different economic underpinnings. Now, all of those public goods are now privately produced and we know from an economic textbook that they are obviously generating more benefit for the world than they can for the person who produced them because in addition to the benefits that the person who produced them get, everybody else gets a free benefit of this public good. Therefore, th what's happened on the internet is that we have picked a whole lot of low-hanging fruit where the cost of producing something is so much smaller than the value that can be created by it as a public good when it's made freely available that it's even in the interests of private for-profit companies to provide that good. So Google and Facebook and Twitter could all be providing the service they provide behind a paywall that we all have to pay for. And you just mentioned that Google might be in that position with Google Maps in Europe. Who knows? But they don't have to do that. The economics are so fantastically good on the Internet that they don't have to do that. Now, what that means, so, so we get these, I would, on the back of my envelope, I would say that Google creates maybe a trillion dollars a, a year in value or search does. Um, uh, uh, Hal Varian from Google calculates it at about a bit less than half of that, but that's an, uh, clearly his methodology is an underestimate. It doesn't really matter what the actual number is. We know that the costs of running Google are vastly lower than the value that it creates. And they're so much lower that Google can make a huge amount of money just by advertising on the site. Now, there are a whole lot, there are going to be a whole lot of other digital public goods, which are more like roads. If you think about a road, you can, if you build a road, you can, you get, you, you, you get the ability to put up advertisements by the side of the road. But we all know that the road will cost you more than the money that you'll be able to get from the, 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 the ads by the side of the road. And so what kinds of goods, what kinds of digital goods are in the position that Google and Facebook and Twitter were in and Wikipedia were in when they, decide, when they made the decision, will we be a private good behind a paywall or will we be a public good privately provided? Well, 23andMe didn't really have that choice because collecting the genome, doing the analysis of your genome from your saliva sample costs them, let's say, $100, and they can't make $100 out of your account, so they charge you. And the fact that they charge you means that the good that they're building, the private good, is much lower value than the public good. Now, how would we build that as a public good? We could build it as a public-private partnership. So in Australia, Medicare, in the US, Medicare, uh, in the United Kingdom, um, the National Health Service. I, I don't know what happens in Ireland, but you've got something going to be called something similar to that. Yeah. Um, uh, they could pay for the cost of the service. They could get the medical system to nudge people into it and say, would you be interested in this service? You don't have to have it. If you don't like it, if it creeps you out, don't bother. But if you do want it, we'll pay. And in return for us paying, you'll get your genome. We'll get your genome as well. We can use that for population-based screening. So lots of governments around the world um, send people reminders and send them home-based kits to do various kinds of tests on themselves. In Australia, when you hit 55 and then when you hit 60, you get a little pack in the mail for to test yourself for bowel cancer, for instance. Now, um, you can use this genome for population-based screening to make the targeting better. You can use it in diagnosis, and it becomes a hugely valuable re research asset much more valuable than if it's a private good because you've got so many more genomes. Um, now, I have very little doubt that that's worth doing. I've got very little doubt that that would be, that would generate a huge amount of value. And I suspect it would, 
generate so much value that in, in any kind of medium to long run framework, it would save the government money. But if it didn't save the government money, it would still be worth investing it in the same way that the governments invest in suburban roads and all the rest of it. So that's an example of a kind of a completely new kind of innovation, uh, 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 innovation intervention, um, which comes out of not not this, if you remember when I started this long explanation, I was talking about the economist seeing this thing called the economy and sort of predicting its movements. Well, that's not how I came up with any of this. I came up with this by saying, wouldn't it be cool if, or is there a way to build more private goods as a public good? And if so, how? And so on. So we can come up with uh, hacks, what I call hacks, policy hacks. We can come up with better ways of doing things. You can often just look around quite directly for better ways of doing things. If you're inside a firm and, you know, people say you, you'll be coming up with ideas about how to make the place run better most weeks, most days. And in many ways, I think economic policy should be more. Uh, of course, we should also pursue economic knowledge in the way that you've described and in the way that comes out of the textbook. But just wandering around, looking at things and asking, could this function better as a subsystem? There's a lot of value in just thinking in that very direct kind of way. Nicholas, um, you're, you're very innovative when it comes to exploring how you can use data and how to identify weak spots in economics and what to target in order for sharing, say, for example, information or how to extract proper data sets. And that has um, spilled over into your entrepreneurial site too. Hmm. And I, I've read that you are the the second shareholder of Kaggle, which was mm -hmm. acquired by Google in March 17, but you're also an angel yep. investor in other companies like um, is it BreezeDocs and Slant.co, HealthKit and Lendable. Yep. So yep. especially those last two, HealthKit and Lendable, to me, they feel very much reliant on uh, information and sh selling information or sharing information with uh, their customers. Is that the same with Kaggle and other other companies that you've been involved in? Uh, well, Kaggle, Kaggle's the first company I invested in, and Kaggle, um, you can go and look it up right now. It's called Kaggle.com, K-A-G-G-L-E.com. It was acquired by Google oh, earlier this year, or maybe it was last year. Um, I actually looked at it, it last night, it, and it looks pretty pretty good. Yeah, it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. And what it does is it takes um, – it, it turns – data prediction into a game in a sense. And so, for instance, imagine you're a bank and you're trying to build a credit scoring model based on your data to predict when customers of yours are most likely to be in danger of default. Um, well, the way we would build that on Kaggle is you would supply us with, uh, and I shouldn't really say us anymore, I'm not a shareholder anymore, but... Um, you would supply us with, say, 100,000, 200,000 anonymized records. Uh, one half of those would become t training data and one half would become test data. So the training data is released so that we get all the characteristics of the customers and the answer as to whether or not they defaulted. And then the test data is data on which – so you then invite people to use the training data to build a model that will predict – the test data, and then you just find out who made. Since nobody's got the answers to the to the test data, it's very easy to work out whose model is the best because it's the model with the highest, with the with the best capacity to make predictions. And it's it was a fascinating thing to be involved in, and it showed me all sorts of ways in which. I mean, one of the main findings is that um, I guess as you would expect. Often, if, you, if you're going to make some new leap in an area, that the ideas will often come from some other area, not from within the field, because a bank will have done all the optimizing that's common and easy in finance, but then somebody turns up who's a physics PhD or something like that and shows how you can use a technique that nobody in that sector is using. The best example I've got is a 
a, a um, compatriot of yours, a fellow called Martin O'Leary, who was a PhD student in glaciology at Oxford, and the competition was in um, detecting dark matter, and it was held by uh, NASA. And it was essentially the and, – and so NASA provided this data and said, we want people to build um, – Models which will help us use artificial intelligence to work out what in our, in our tele, you know, what we're looking at, or it's a radio telescope, so you're not looking at it, but anyway, what in our radio telescope scans is dark matter and what is not dark matter. And that's a signal to noise problem. And, um, the cosmologists had got so far, and it's a, it's a sort of, if you like, not sure that this is an entirely accurate way to present it, but let me let, indulge me. If you like, this is a black on black signal to noise problem. You're looking for dark matter against the background of nothing in the universe, which is pretty dark, pretty <laughs> black. And Martin O'Leary was a glaciologist, and he had a white on white signal to noise problem, which was that when you're looking at an image from a satellite, is that little white thing you can see a glacier or a cloud or something or, or a reflection of the sky? Hmm. And so he developed algorithms that may, that allowed him to race to the front of the race very early on in the competition because he'd worked out ways of solving this problem that were quite unknown to the cosmologists. And then you can watch the competition and the cosmologists see that he can do something that they can't and they sort of rack their brains and try to improve and they did improve but he ended up improving as well and he ended up winning it so so that's a anyway that's an interesting it was a it was a a, a fun uh, it's a fun it's it, it's a fun company and a fun uh, uh you know every every competition was its own adventure of that kind so, so when you're working on something like this, you work privately, or can everyone see what you're working on live, or in different uh, settings? Well, um, obviously, then they could. That's do. up to you. Yeah, no, it's okay. up to you. You can. Uh, uh, I mean, the um, the site now is a site a little bit like GitHub for mm. uh, coders, uh, where people do data science online, um, uh, but. But, yeah, it's, it's up to them uh, what they share and what they don't share. One of the things that we used to do, I mean, probably still do, um, is you might have a competition that runs for quite a long period of time and then you will provide an interim prize to the winner at a particular point in time in return for releasing their code. And then you release that to the, to the community and then everybody gets to uh, have another crack. So there are, you know, there are different ways of breaking up the closedness of it and the openness of it and so on. So if anyone's done some research and are unsure what to do with their topic on, they could always go into Kaggle and find out what is being yep, worked on yep. at the moment there's and like, well, there's get a million, all their data. There's a million data scientists. There's a million data scientists registered there. So And what's great about it is one. they'll come from all different disciplines. As you yeah, said, you're exactly. a glaciologist and working with a cosmologist. Exactly. And it's, exactly. you get an unlikely source who ends up bringing this understanding of dark matter uh, forward. Yeah. Yep. No, it's it's amazing. Innocentive, a, a, a consulting site, reports something quite similar, which is so Innocentive hosts technical challenges, nothing to do with Kaggle commercially, but it hosts technical challenges, and I think it's built a sort of consultancy business around that. And... It finds likewise that I think 70 or 80 percent of the solutions to technical challenges that are posed come from outside the industry and the discipline from within which they are posed. Mm. Like um, we, we, we wrap up soon, Nicholas, but just to go on that, like there, there lies the difficulty and just going full circle based on the, our, the earlier part of this conversation. In mm -hmm. economics, as you mentioned, it's not physics, and we are dealing with also behavioral aspects, which mm -hmm. uh, NASA isn't dealing with when it deals with a uh, crowd or yeah. dark matter and that. So yeah. um, that's the challenge we have as economists, and we can never predict where 
an economy could go or how the stock market may change based on changes to certain parameters or variables. Hmm. I think that's right. I yeah. think that's pretty true. And and it's also, I mean, one of the things that's sort of remarkable is that I don't know how many, whether you have read the works of Philip Tetlock, uh, expert political judgment and super forecasters, but what one one thing that is just sort of leaves me kind of gobsmacked i was actually writing about it on my website today is that the whole way in which in which economists forecast is whether they well whether they know it or not and i'm not even a forecaster you know i'm not an expert at this but you can tell that the whole way the the game is set up is wrong hmm. so how does a weather forecaster forecast a weather forecaster's forecast is a forecast of how much knowledge they have. So they will say the chance of rain tomorrow is 60% or 20%. You can then take all of those predictions and say, we would like for every, you know, we're going to look at the last hundred times that this agency or this forecaster predicted there was a 60% chance of rain the next day. And we're going to ask how many what proportion of the days were rainy and we want it to be around 60%. And if it's not around 60%, we know they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> now. And, and so weather forecasting is as part of the forecast is a reflection on how much, you know, it's not a reflection. It's not proving anything to anyone about how clever you are. It is getting you to understand how much, you know, and then, make that transparent to the world. Now, what do we do in economic forecasts? Economic forecasts are point forecasts. So there'll be things like next year, we expect growth to be 1.75%. Well, that doesn't tell you enough about what confidence the forecaster has in that forecast. Um, what you need is you want, a, you need a, you need a forecast like we forecast that there is a 40% chance or an 80% chance of growth being within 0.2% of that figure. And if we, and, and so the whole way we make forecasts is such that economists never actually learn very much. Don't pass it on to the people they forecast it, uh, the, those forecasts to. We don't have, if, if I asked you, who's famous for being a better forecaster than other people, I would draw a blank. Mm. Um, and I don't think that would be the true in weather forecasting. Um, I mean, neither of us know enough about weather forecasting to uh, to know that. But I can tell you that one of the things that Philip Tetlock says is that weather forecasters are not, no weather forecasters are not known uh, for their hubris. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not known to be overconfident. Well, Economic forecasters are. Economic forecasters in both the private sector and the public sector are allowed to be overconf overconfident. Well, you know, the words overconfident and forecaster are in some tension with each other, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> don't you think that a forecast, that the very thing, the one thing that a forecaster would know was how not to be overconfident? And yet that's not the case. Um, so that's another area where we're sort of looking in the wrong place. We're looking for all the fancy techniques. And of course, it's good for those things to go on because that's where the forecasts ultimately have to come from. But we have not done what Kaggle did with data science, which is to make the process of working out who's performing transparent. Isn't that amazing? Mm. All these, all these people who are very smart, people with a strong mathematical background and they're party to this setup, which is mostly role-playing. It doesn't actually generate useful information. You'd be very sceptical to, to listen to what forecasters have to say. And mm. ev even just slightly off point or even on a weekend looking at match commentary or pre-match analysis, mm. the amount of forecasts that are made by these experts in horse mm. racing or soccer or any other game that's being played. And they pretty much always get it. Well, you, you get some that'll get it right, but they pretty much all get it wrong. 
Well, well, I, I actually liken economic forecasting to that sort of before the game sort of punditry on TV is that, I mean, before the game punditry, if people find it entertaining, that's great. But the most sensible thing to do before the game is to shut up. And then if you think that some, you know, if you think that so and so is going to kick two goals in the, in the, in the football, you, you better just, you know, there's not much you can do by forecasting it. You just better, you, you're much better saving your breath and finding out what happened. Um, likewise, we do almost no, almost no retrospective analysis of whose forecasts came out right and or better mm. and why and whose forecasts over time are more reliable. There's very little inf- there's very little material on that. It's it is the sort of thing which I've argued central forecasting agencies for government should be they should be setting up forecasting competitions which do precisely that and which ma- and which do the sort of thing that Philip Tetlock did in all kinds of areas for economic forecasting mm-hmm. that would be a much better use of their uh, of their resources than issuing forecasts which are issued in a form which disguises how much information is actually in them disguises it not just from us the people who are forecasted at but the very forecasters who are making the forecast in the first place. It's 12 p.m. here now in Ireland, and the sun is splitting <laughs> the rocks. And what time is it in Australia, Nicholas? <laughs> uh, it's 11. It's 11 p.m. Um, so it's uh, 11 at night. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate you, you know, coming on, and you're you're very patient with me because there was a couple of times we had to reschedule because no of problem. changes on my side. Hey, but you're yep. coming over to Ireland on I am. next I'm week. I am. coming right? over for Kilconomics next week. Yeah, and are you looking forward to it? I'm just looking there to see. I love you're... Ireland. Yeah. I love Ireland and I love Kilconomics. Everybody should go there once. I've Well, I have first ended up there somewhat sceptical. Uh, uh, for listeners who've never heard of it, it's held in Kilkenny and it's a festival of economics and comedy, and that sounded a bit silly to me. But when I first went there, I realized that it was a marvelous way to uh, essentially what happens is very good, mostly Irish comedians are the compares. They turn up in suits and us economists turn up in our civvies and they're mostly panel discussions and interviews. And the comedians kind of depompossify the the economists and economists are desperately in need of depompossification, I think. <laughs> and um, there are lots of terrific Financial Times columnists much uh, the, the columnists in the financial times um, amazingly impressive some of them and um anyway just lots of very interesting economists with very uh with views that are uh, quite striking and i know i normally don't much like panel shows where you hear people telling you again what you heard them say on the tv but these are these people are not firstly i'm not that well exposed to them um on the telly, uh, but secondly, they're just people. They're all sorts of fascinating people um, with very interesting things to say. And then, when you've finished your either watching a session or being on the panel, you often walk out of your little off the off the stage and into a pub, and <laughs> some local will grab you and say, "Oh, I think you were wrong about Wall Street," or "I didn't uh, I didn't agree with your point about this," and you they they shout your pint of Guinness and you get stuck into it all over again. So I've um I'll be I'll I'll probably keep going for as long as they invite me and so far they've continued to invite me. Uh this is my third one. Okay. I, I I'm only down the road so I'm hopefully I'll get to meet you there. I was there two years ago and I've went to a set with Deirdre McCloskey and Rory Sutherland and Nicholas Nassim Taleb. And they oh, were well, all I was on the stage on, I was together. there. I was, I was, um, I don't know whether I, I was certainly on stage with all of those people. I was on stage with Nicholas Nassim Taleb and Rory Sutherland, um, on one evening. And then the next day in the set theatre, uh, 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 Deirdre McCluskey and me and two or three other people were, um, battling it out. Deirdre's okay. very, very, um, I think of her as very ideological, um, so I, we were battering each other about a bit. <laughs> but we each had a fair bit of respect for the other, I think. Yeah, I actually, to follow what they were talking about, they were talking about Nassim's um, skin in the game. 
So oh, no, well, that wasn't – he hadn't published that by that when I went to it. But that was – I don't think it was Skin in the Game because that was no. three years ago. And I was there the, the I was there last year, and he wasn't there last year. And neither was Deirdre, I don't think. No, uh, they, they actually just brought it up in conversation. They used it. And they, they, he must have been writing about it, and I think he had wrote an uh, article yeah, in, the, in Medium. Yeah. But I used it yeah. as a, a way of – just immediately after the the set was finished, I just jumped up on the stage and it was my way of introducing myself to Deirdre and that's how I got her onto the podcast. Ah, good. So, yeah, so we yeah. spoke that well, way. So. Well, she certainly knows a lot. <laughs> yeah. So knows hopefully. a lot about the bourgeois virtues and all that stuff. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something different and something interesting, you know. And uh, yeah, I'd love to, you know, maybe have a pint with you when we, yeah, when we meet each do. other. And please come great. and say hi. Yeah, Please come and say hi. Perfect. Well, we've we've got we've, we're in good um, we're in good email contact, and now we're in Skype contact. So yeah. uh, you can ring me anytime you're around, and vice versa. Cool. Yeah, nice one. That's great, Nicholas. And I, I'd love to have you on again because I've done a lot of reading. You you sent me a lot of links, and I yep. read a lot. And there was so much I, wa- I wanted to talk about Adam Smith. I wanted to talk about dem- love democracy. To, love and to talk about Adam Smith. Love fantastic. to talk about Adam Smith. Love to talk about democracy. That's uh, music to my ears. So, um, <laughs> uh, the the democracy stuff. I mean, it's not entirely easy to shoehorn it into economics, but um, you know, I guess like Hayek, I've. Uh, wandered off into political into thinking about politics because it's sort of where a lot of it takes you and the reason I'm feel as strongly about it as I do is not because the problem is as dire as it is which I think it is but because I think I have I have come upon a quite a strong set of ideas which at least me at least I think of as kind of intellectually orienting our way out, my way out of the the mess. All I have to do now is convince other people that it makes sense. So maybe if you can help me do that, we'll. Uh, cool. There you are. I'll save democracy for you with nice. your help. Can I actually and ask you one else. more question, Nicholas? Yeah, sure. Um, do you have a book recommendation? I know you mentioned a couple of them. Tetlock's book, and um, there was another one you previously mentioned. But if there was somebody that you could, that you feel could be introduced to your world? Is there something that uh, you might recommend? Oh, something that would introduce them to, well, I mean, I haven't written a book, so I can't recommend a book. I've certainly written plenty of essays. Um, or something so, that inspired they can you. Check me out. Yeah, well, as far as inspiring me is concerned, it's a very, it's, people ask me this, they say, what books can you recommend? And I think, People have had much bigger impact on me than books that I've read. Books that I recommend, I mean, I can think of John Kay's The Truth About Markets. It was published as The Truth About Markets in a, in Australia and I think England and by another name in the US. Um, but I'd also be I, – I kind of admire – like there are favorite bloggers that I've got. Uh, Steve Randy Waldman's Into Fluidity is probably my favorite. I don't read it all the time, but it's uh, because it's every post that Steve puts up is a pretty serious thing to get your teeth into. There's a woman called Carolyn Sissoko who writes a blog called Synthetic Assets. I don't think I fully understand all her arguments, but they're really interesting arguments which argue that the – the, the, the city of London, when it was the centre of the financial world in the 19th century, or certainly a centre of the financial world in the 19th century, still is, had a set of institutions which ma- meant, which managed to really um, handle, well, to prevent financial crises and to knit together the financiers and the uh, so, so you have a trader who might be making something, buying something from another country, and t- the, they and their customer and the customer's bank and their bank are all together as four cl- cross-guaranteeing parties. And, that's, and she paints this picture of a monetary system built around that relationship, which, of course, we've now unpicked and and uh, we basically collateralized everything because it's it's cheaper and you don't have to worry about relationships and you don't have to learn to trust anyone you just add up what the valuation of their property is and lend against it um so that's i i just love people who are working stuff out for themselves who are saying things that are 
interesting and different to what I've heard and simple and compelling. So those are two examples. But um, I also like reading Paul Krugman, with whom I had a bit of a debate earlier this year. He's just so tremendously facile. I mean, I don't mean that in the in the disparaging way, but he's got this incredible ability to just churn stuff out, and it's very it sparkles that the the uh, the 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 text just sparkles with energy and clarity. Um, so that's that's great as well. And you know, you made it when you have the critics as well, because he has a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he yeah, he he's a bit. Um, He's he's a little bit too. Uh, I, well, look, I mean, I'm criticising him for something I like him for, which is that um, he will keep at the same sort of subject. But um, he's not a person of. He doesn't. He, he he doesn't look for ways that he might be wrong. I think is a mm-hmm. reasonable way to put it. But as a as an advocate for a position that I think is. You know, in America with the Republican Party the way they are, I'm afraid I'm just very sympathetic to his outrage at what is happening, um, at the fact that science doesn't matter anymore, pretty much nothing matters. And um, the money and the memes behind the various political positions are taking the place over and sending us all mad. So I think of Paul Krugman as kind of trying to help us stay sane. I must actually check out that episode on Tyler Cowen's Conversations with Tyler Cowen. You had oh, him recently on Paul Krugman. Yeah, I haven't listened to it yeah, yet yeah, now, yeah. so I must do. Yeah, no, no, no. That's that's good. It's um, he's just being reflect. You know, he's uh, as Tyler Cowen says, this is Paul as an academic, and he's a. I mean, it's pretty obvious that he knows a great deal and uh, has thought a great deal. It's quite it's quite noticeable though that there are quite there are some things. I'm not sure I can give you an example, but there are some things that I would have thought he ought to have thought about that he hasn't. He just says, look, I haven't thought about that much. And he's not that reflective in that way, but he's just a tremendously powerful <laughs> operator in his hitting zone. Yeah. Nicholas, it's been great talking to you. I look forward to meeting you that week, uh, maybe the Friday the 9th or Saturday the 10th of November. Uh, I, I'll try and get this episode out actually earlier. I know there's... Um, That'd be good. And then we can, anyone else who wants to come... Um, exactly. maybe we can all meet if anyone wants to come to Kilconomics. Yeah, because you're on Friday night and Saturday night, so we could have our own. Am I? I mean, I've looked at it, but I haven't. I, I, yeah. yeah, whatever. I, I think that's right. I'm on on Friday nights and Saturday. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So uh, thanks very much again. Um, you are an economic rock star. If people want to find yeah. out more about you, Nicholas, they can check out Lateral Economics or go through the website economicrockstar.com forward slash yep. Nicholas Groon, G-R-U-E-N. And there'll be links there that could redirect you to some of your work and uh, a lot of the articles and posts that you have put up there that you have shared with me. I'll put them, link them all up on my website as well. Perfect. And if anyone wants to, uh, you know, send me a line, drop me a line, they should feel free. Um, Where could I find you? Uh, well, yeah, they'll be able to find my yeah. email on the net. It's uh, ngruen, N-G-R-U-E-N, at gmail.com is the easiest way to get me. Great. Thanks very much, Nicholas. And I'll talk to you soon and we can set up another call schedule on Skype. Sounds good. Thanks, Frank. Have a good night's sleep. Bye. Okay. Right here. Bye. Bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, 
please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the economic rockstar website. If you enjoy this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.